you're listening to the Mondays with Midger podcast, founder and CEO of Legal Leadership, a company specialising in the leadership training and coaching of lawyers. Get set to jumpstart your week with a shot of mojo as Midger and her guests talk all things life, love and leadership. Hey, it's Monday and I'm Midger and welcome to the podcast all about life, love and leadership. And on the podcast, we have a very special guest in the studio this morning, the wonderful Stacey Miller from Cronin Miller Litigation. So welcome to the podcast, Stacey. Thanks, Midge. I'm so happy to be here. On yet another rainy, gloomy day on the Gold Coast. It is very wet. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, Stacey, tell us a little bit about, I suppose, what you're doing right now in your career. Um, I know that you're a partner at Cronin Miller Litigation, but tell us a little bit more about what a week or a day looks like for you right now. Okay. Um, Well, as a partner of a law firm, it's busy all the time anyway, but what my days and weeks actually look like is um, a lot of beyond the, the law firm itself because I've got three girls at home. I often feel like I've run a marathon by the time I get to work in the morning. I might have had several arguments with different children over different things, usually their hair, um, what they were having for breakfast, why their school, school books are all wet, things like that. So um, I'm usually quite exhausted by the time I get to the office. <laughs> And then I can sort of sit in my chair and relax for 10 minutes before someone comes in and needs something. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, on a day-to-day basis, I do do a lot of file work. I do do a lot with clients um, because I love the practice of law. Mm -hmm. Um, So I hang on to that quite a lot. Um, You know, I'll have the occasional lunch and the occasional coffee, but... Not the occasional lunches, <laughs> Stacey. <laughs> well, no, there's been a few lunches. There, well, look, there are a few lunches, but they are well spaced. I think gone are the days. Um, certainly, when I started out in law, every Friday afternoon was a long lunch, and it wouldn't be odd to disappear from the office at eleven thirty and not come back. Um, I know that's why I had dreams of being a partner of yeah. a law firm because I thought that's what it was going to be. And then when I became partner, I was like. Oh, times have changed now. We're not, you know, finishing at 11 o'clock on a Friday and uh, yeah, and having huge long lunches that turn into dinners. That's and right. I mean, if you do that um, very, very infrequently for me, then you pay for it in other ways. And I don't just mean a hangover. I mean you have to give up some other valuable time to, mm. to catch up. And clients expect you to be on call and around and available and um, I actually get a little bit sick of the, oh, it's Friday afternoon, I'm surprised you're in the office. I was like, well, actually, you'll usually find me in the office on a Friday afternoon and I'll be taking the calls at five to five. You you will reach me. You're not going to catch me out. (laughs) So it's an interesting point you make there around, you know, still being on the file, still doing client work and file work because I know uh, for some people in senior leadership positions and particularly owners of law firms, they're not so heavily involved in file and client work. So tell me a little bit about the balance for you Mm. between the people leadership and and strategic leadership space but also being an expert lawyer and litigator. How do you kind of balance that? It's it's hard to strike that balance because um, you have to be so many different things to different people, as you know. And in a law firm of our side, we've got 12 lawyers. Um, For me to be on tools and potentially tied up in a court case for five days up in Crowell in Brisbane, um, there's a real potential for someone to miss out on something they need in the office. So to have your finger on the HR pulse, so to speak, as well as meeting the needs and expectations of a client can get really tricky. And it's definitely a trap that I fall into and I'm the first to admit that sometimes I don't handle it very well. Um, And I'll get called out on it by my team. They'll say, look, you weren't here and I needed you or you have been oblivious to this problem because you've been so tied up in ABC. Um, And, you know, I'll I'll fall on my sword and realise that perhaps I need more of a balance than what I have been achieving I actually made a bit of a resolution for myself this year. Mm -hmm. Um, It's taken me this long um, to realise I do need to take a step back from file work and file load and I've made a conscious decision to do that this year. Um, I've pushed down a lot more work than I had previously. Uh, It's hard to do unless you have a team and the structure of a team that you need and can actually accommodate 
when the partner does do that to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're getting there. It's 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 not always easy, and you know, and life happens to your team members as well. When we have people off sick, I've just had a team member go on maternity leave a little bit earlier than expected. Um, so it's always a mad shuffle mm. um, to make sure that you can accommodate everything. And I find myself stepping in to fill gaps. Yes. And I I know, because I know what you think about these things, Mitch, <laughs> <laughs> that I still need to work on not doing that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's uh, – it can be a tough space, particularly I think there are lawyers, I know you're one of them, that – as you said, love the practice of law, you know, so for them that still lights them up inside Mm. to be able to do client work and to do file work. Um, So as you said, pushing that down, delegating that, uh, extending trust uh, to others in the team and from even from a client's perspective when they've been dealing with you for a long time, the trust and that reputation piece is, is with you. So bringing others on board and, you know, promoting those other lawyers and those Mm. relationships with clients. It can feel like a risk sometimes, Mm. especially with those clients that you have been working with for many years um, and they don't don't understand why there's a sudden movement or shift towards, oh, no, speak to my senior associate or or she's always on um, hand for you as well. Um, There's almost a re-education or retraining that needs to take place with them. Um, so you need to have some forward planning around that. Absolutely, absolutely. So in the partnership, and obviously there's yourself and Derek Cronin. Yes. Um, and we had Derek on the podcast a yes. little while ago. He did not mention me, Mitch, <laughs> um, so I'm annoyed that he's come up so quickly in this podcast. <laughs> he would love it that he has, but I can, I can, uh, I can actually relate to that, that uh, annoyance there around that. <laughs> Um, and so certainly my experience at Shine, I was at Shine, you know, for a long time and we had two owners of the firm uh, for a long time and it was Steve and Simon mm. and there was a particular dynamic between Steve and Simon and we would kind of know when an issue or a problem came up, it was either let's go to Simon about this or no, this is a Steve yes. issue. Let's go to Steve yes. and don't worry Simon about it. Depending on, you know, it's like mum and dad, like we, which answer do we want to get and who do we go to for what? Yes. Is there a little bit of that dynamic and, you know, what would you say, you know, people go to you for? <laughs> what do people go to Derek for? And and, and, and just and, – and, but seriously around how um, to create a leadership team where there's – uh, there's a difference and there's certainly you bring different skills and different perspective, but there's a connection and vision and values and that kind of stuff. So talk to me about that. How does that play out? Yeah, okay. Um, well, 100% there is that dynamic at our firm um, and I don't think anyone will be surprised by that. Derek and I are very different um, in a lot of ways, um, but we hold a lot of those similar beliefs and values and um, goals for the firm that, w- that you just mentioned. Um in terms of what they might go to me about and what they might go to Derek about, um, look, I feel like I just get all the serious stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> whether it's HR related or, um, you know, whether it's problems prioritising work or issues with a client, um, I feel like the first port of call is me um, That's and that's across the board. Um, if somebody wants to go to one of those 11.30 lunches and not come back for the afternoon, they'll probably go ask Derek. <laughs> Because he'll be the first to say, wait, what what lunch is this? Is this something that I should be going to as well? Um, So, yeah, look, there is that. And um, I think a lot of the time, because it's so busy, you know, I'm probably oblivious to all the things that Derek gets asked about that I don't know about. And I know that he doesn't know a lot of the things that I deal with as well. I mean, we have a very open and um, communicative um, partnership but at the same time, you know, when you've got 16, 17 staff, there's a lot going on all the time. But, yeah, there, there are um, subject matters that I I know that they don't even think twice about coming and knocking on my door, mm. which is fine. And, look, I think this is, this is the point around the podcast and interviewing different leaders is that all different shapes and sizes, our leaders come in, our great leaders come in, 
Um, and knowing your own magic, knowing your own style, mm. knowing what you bring. So I think sometimes, you know, people can try and uh, think that there's a mould of leadership or I want to be that kind of leader or yeah. even sometimes I need to be quite extroverted or I need to be this to be a leader and it's – and I'm like, absolutely, we see lots of different examples yeah, of and that. Yeah, and there's different moulds, um, but you can't necessarily fit – yourself into somebody else's mold and we have to accept and embrace that um i'm a nurturer and um derek is not a nurturer but he's many other things Mm -hmm. and our um we have one of those partnerships that are very complementary yes Um, you know skills um strengths and weaknesses um in personality type as well as in in skills matrix like legal skills and things like that so um you know i I certainly accept that my style is different to a lot of other people um, and it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that that's just something that when you're in a good partnership, or, you know, is of, of benefit when you've got Absolutely. two completely different types of leaders. Mm. So looking at recruitment within the firm, um, and I guess what – young professionals are looking for Mm. you know right now um in in their careers in their choice of employer around the type of leader who they want to follow talk to me about that and, and what you're hearing or what people are talking to you about what makes people stay yeah yeah i look it's such a great question um, and a hard question and I wish I had the answer to it um, for all my lawyers um, because sometimes I really wonder. (laughs) (laughs) Recruitment's really hard, um, especially at the market at the moment. It's really very difficult. Um, But everybody is motivated by different things. So as leaders, we need to recognise that there are those different motivations and sometimes it takes a little while to work it out Mm. because um, I'm very – I'm an open book. Um, ask me a question, you'll get an honest answer. I've got zero poker face, so people know what I'm thinking all the time. I'm usually in resting bitch face mode. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, if, if you say something I don't like, you'll know. So so people know what they get with me um, and my team know that as well. Um, in terms of, you know, how to meet the needs of these new lawyers coming in, junior lawyers, and also accommodating the career paths that they're on, mm. um, you're not going to be everything to everyone. Um, so you just have to make the most of the time that you have with them. I, I mean, we've had lawyers come in that I knew had aspirations to go to the bar. Um, yes. I knew they wouldn't be with us long term. But I'm very committed to um, the professional development of anyone and everyone who comes through our doors and spends time with us. Um, and they appreciate that. And that in itself then is something that helps drive team culture Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we're all collaborating and working within an environment that is at least meeting their needs, whether it's short-term or long-term. And that's something that, you know, I think lawyers entering the market or perhaps considering a move should be mindful of Mm -hmm. um, because it's not just about what you can do for your law firm it's what the law firm can do for you and what your leaders can do for you um in such a competitive market like this it's important to know that it's you know it's a it's a two-way relationship uh, which is really different to when I was a junior lawyer um I was just so excited and thrilled to have a job Mm -hmm. which meant that I didn't have to you know work part-time somewhere waiting tables um and there's not that mentality. I feel like at the moment it's more uh, open to lawyers to jump around, um, which is fine, um, move on to bigger and better things perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, 20 years ago um, I was, yeah, really excited to have a job and, and would do anything to keep that job for fear of not having it anymore. <laughs> so I think, it, you know, that's dictated somewhat by backgrounds and upbringings and, all that sort of thing Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Different, different time. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, the question I get asked, one of the questions I get asked mostly is, you know, what else can I do with my law degree? Mm. Or I've been practising for a while. What else is yeah. available? And I'm kind of like, well... Everyone's so entrepreneurial. Yeah, I mean, a lot. Like, where's um, all this energy come yeah. from? 
I'm so no. tired all the time. <laughs> Sometimes I like when they talk to me and they're like they tell me what they've done, like their CVs, they tell me what yes. they've done. And I'm just like, what, you're 25 yeah. and that's already what you've done? I mean, at 25 I was like just, yes, just been admitted. I was just kind of starting out. The resume was quite short. Mm. There wasn't a lot there. And now I'm like, wow, yeah, okay, even, that's impressive. A lot of the time I find, especially with the, um, the uni graduates, there's such a long list of accomplishments and competitions and work practical experience. I mean, my CV had eight years of <laughs> deli chick at Woolworths yes. on it and, and a pamphlet run. That's like, right. That was my entrepreneurial spirit. I know. I do, I do wonder, Stacey, and, and, you know, maybe, I mean, we'll have to see, but I do wonder that the, the pace and, and the, the, the self-expectations, you know, in your 20s, I'm like when – you know, you hit kind of my age at nearly 50, whether you're just like done and exhausted by that yeah. point or will you keep going? I don't know. But I kind of like feel like I started off pretty slow, like it was just like a gradual yeah. thing, easing in. And um, and it's only been kind of for me the last couple of years that I felt like I've hit my stride a little bit with oh, my okay. – yeah. my, um, with what I really, really want to do. Yes. And people often ask me in their 20s, they're like, I want to find my – you know, you seem very passionate. I want to find my passion and I want to do this. And I'm like, it took me a very long time. I hope it doesn't take as yeah. long. But it's kind of, um, yeah, interesting conversation. And as you said, very different. I think the practice of law, uh, even leadership, um, workplaces, corporate life, very different now than – then back, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've been practising law for 20 years now or just shy of 20 years. And mm-hmm. before that, I was in the public service um, with the Attorney General's Department down in Canberra. So um, have been in the legal industry for a long time. Um, and my path is probably a lot more traditional than anything you'll see these days. Yes. Um, you know, with, with these um, younger generations wanting to change or, or always striving for something more. That's not to say I wasn't striving for something more. It's... I had a path and I, I, I followed it and perhaps um, perhaps I will strive for something different in the next few years or five, ten, whatever it may be. But I don't know, maybe they're energised because change is as good a, as a holiday, as they yes. say. Yes, yes. Um, but, uh, you know, also when you get to where you are now, um, you're open to these experiences and you appreciate them for what you are because of the journey you've had to get to this point. Mm-hmm. Whereas, um, I don't know, maybe maybe they will be receiving it differently if they have had all these opportunities that they're jumping to the next one and the next one. And I'm not being critical of that. It sounds mm. a little bit critical. It's just um, different. Yeah, it's just yeah, a different what experience. I'm used to. Yeah. And it will... Be interesting to see how it plays out throughout mm. their career. Yes, it's when the you've longevity. Got, yeah, you question. Yeah, forty years or yeah. so of working, um, and yeah, what does that what does that look like? Um, because certainly, as, as we're seeing, um, particularly in the legal profession, not great stats mm. around burnout, about attrition rates, um, about mental health of lawyers. So what in that space do you feel that just, I suppose, individually and uh, as a law firm owner we can be doing to to help that out? Yeah, I think um, certainly having a spotlight on that issue is just being a really um, – it's, it's present. You have mm-hmm. to acknowledge it and be aware of it and uh, we have open discussions about it, um, you know, as a law firm, you know, Derek and I can do little things to try and promote health and well-being in the office. Um, you know, we have a masseuse come in every six weeks and give everyone a 15-minute um, massage, which is which is nice, but <laughs> probably need to go a little bit beyond that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but just having a genuine care and interest in our staff, um, checking in with them and making sure that um, they're coping, trying to balance their workloads as much as possible. Um, it's hard. It's hard in a busy practice and, um, you know, it's it can be a very high-stress environment. So, um, you know, we do, in, we do try to – we have weekly staff meetings um, where we try to keep a handle or do keep a handle on what everyone's workflow looks like, mm-hmm. um, try and see if we can 
evenly distribute that, um, you know, promote taking time off, um, getting out of the office um, together or by, by yourselves. Um, we are, you know, two blocks, not even two, yeah, two blocks from um, the ocean in Surface Paradise. Um, I know some of our staff go for lunchtime walks, which is great. Yes. Um, we did, um, you know, during Mental Health Awareness um, Month, we'll, we'll do a, a walk for mental health campaign as well and, and do all that sort of thing. Um, but it has to be, it has to be constant and I understand that. And um, again, sometimes I have failings because you get so busy. Yes. Um, and in, again, it's hard to keep that finger on the pulse for everybody. So really what I have to just trust in is that I openly communicate and share with my team members all the time and I am constantly trying to provide an environment where they feel the same that they can come and talk yes. to me and I do have that relationship with them. I do know that if they're struggling, they will come and talk to me and that's really important to me. Um, because if I felt like they weren't, then yes, I'd need to get other measures in place to make sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a big issue, um, and I worry about it for my girls and making sure that we're doing everything now, not just within you know my little space, obviously, but more collectively as a community to make sure that everybody knows that this is an issue that's everybody's problem, yes. not just those suffering with mental health, not just those that have that issue in their workplace, but everybody's problem. Mm -hmm. um, because if we're collectively targeting that issue, um, then it means that for future generations, it's not going to be taboo to talk about. It is going to be something that um, those measures are in place for everyone. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I have that same thing with, you know, talking to my kids um, around that and just focusing on what's important, um, what's not, what to kind of you know, um, let go of mm. uh, around that. Um, and certainly I think doing meaningful work, doing work that's on purpose, yeah. being part of a team that you're proud to be a part of, a firm you're proud to be a part of, all of that um, can really make a huge difference, particularly when you've got to do the – well, when you do the long hours, right? Yeah. When you do the long hours, you've got to dig deep and all of that, if it's on purpose um, and it's meaningful work, you know, what does Simon Sinek say? Well, then it's not stress, right? Yeah. If it's well, meaningful right. work, if it's on purpose, yeah. then it's exciting. Yeah. Um, and we can handle that kind of pressure. And also I love the point you said around rit rituals and routines, mm. even during the busy period yes. when sometimes – the exercise goes and the eating habits go and the catching up with friends and the beach walk during yeah. the lunchtime goes because it's a crazy busy week when in fact, ironically, that's the week you need the beach walk well, the most. that's right. And you have, to, <laughs> you have to lock it in. I mean, make it a calendar entry, a non-negotiable for you that you do that. And everything will work in around that. It, mm -hmm. it will. I, you have to have these outlets that make um, that work stay purposeful and meaningful for you. Um, I so I coach my ten year olds netball team. So on a Thursday afternoon, it's a non negotiable in my calendar that from three o'clock I'm just out. Mm -hmm. I mean I'll log back on after I get home, but that won't be till seven o'clock. Um, and that for me, it sometimes makes my week ridiculously busy <laughs> and ridiculously stressful because I know oh no I'm not going to be there Thursday afternoon, and yet I've got court on Friday morning, or I've got a team member that needs me. Um, but they know it's there and that's something that I do um, for my, um, not just for my kids obviously, but also for my own um, mum guilt yes. <laughs> and personal satisfaction, I do that as well. Um, so, if, so, you know, from that, putting it in your calendar, recognising that it's something that is, it is important to you and important enough to make sure that you make that commitment to do for yourself every single week mm -hmm. and leave it there. Yeah. So if that's the beach walk or that's a coffee with a friend, um, then and that's important to you and that helps you keep that balance, then do it. Yeah, that real boundary piece. Um, I know it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. People are talking about that boundary piece, but it's so important. Like what, what do I set in stone there? So then what do I have to say no to because of that? Yes. And that's absolutely okay. Yes. Um, I was going to touch upon um, motherhood, law, being a leader, you know, partner of a law firm, 
How does that all work? <laughs> you give us the magic re- answer to that, but because I know a lot of people listening and, and things, particularly um, you know, those who might be starting a family or you know stepping up in their yeah. career, and I know that they they look to yourself and others and go, "Wow, like yeah. she's got it all." <laughs> it's all, so. Well, it's it's so funny that you asked this question because I had this conversation um, with my lawyer who went on maternity leave just yes. last week. Yep. Um, and I've had this conversation with her before and I've had it with others. Um, you can have it all. Of course you can. But it's about balance and perspective and realising that you can't have it all right now. Um, yes. It takes time. It really does. Um, I, um, I've i got a busy family life, um, certainly, um, but balance for me is not about splitting time between work and family and having, whether it's 50-50 or mm-hmm. 70-30, 80-20, no, because I can't, I can't set that in stone. If I tried to do that, if I tried to say, right, I'm doing 50%, 50% here, um, it would do my head in. But when I am at home, I'm 100% at home. And when I'm at work, I'm 100% focused on work. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm having me time, it's 100% focus on me time. And that, to me, is balance. It's not about, you know, the the, the metrics of balance. It's about um, you ensuring that you're in the moment that with presence. the people that you're... Yeah, it's about that presence, that people that you're with. Um, so, look, it hasn't always been easy. Um, I, you know, the path to even just being a partner at, at Cronin Miller Litigation was obviously... Um, it's never easy path to partnership, um, no matter what people think from the outside. Mm-hmm. Um, I I used to work in Brisbane and Derek and I met each other in Brisbane and worked together for a short time at a boutique legal practice up there um, and then he moved down and established the firm. Um, I kept working up there for a few years and eventually he, um, you know, wooed me down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I commuted for two years. Um, wow, I lived okay. in Brisbane because I, I have um, two sisters in Brisbane so I had a bit of a support network there and I had all my friends there. Um, so when I moved, when I started commuting down here, I was four or five months pregnant with my second and I knew nobody. Yeah. The only people I knew were Derek and Tom. So it was a really um, difficult time for me because that, that meant the only people I really knew was the other lawyers and staff at Cronin Litigation as it w- then was. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that period of time that I was commuting, I wasn't really here on the Gold Coast. I mean, yes. I, I didn't form a network. I, I didn't have any um, real connection other than the office. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after I had Madeline, um, I returned to work um, after I'd had five months off with her. I was still commuting, but my, wow. hus- my husband moved to Canberra. And so I had um, the two girls at home um, I would drop them off at a family daycare in Brisbane and drive down here. I'd get here just before 9 o'clock, which is actually about the same, same time I get to work now, even though school's only 15 minutes away. <laughs> um, but I'd get to work and I would just be laser-focused on my work all day and then I'd have to leave by 4.30 to go pick them up um, in Brisbane, take them home. Usually it would be jam sandwiches for dinner. Like, I was just the worst mum, <laughs> worst mum ever. Um, and... So exhausting. Um, Canberra was supposed to be three months. It ended up being nine months that he was living wow. living it up down there in his bachelor pad um, for work. <laughs> he would come back every second or third weekend. Um, and I had so many meltdowns and my sister would show up on the doorstep in her pyjamas going, oh, I could tell by the tone that you really needed to talk to me today. Yes. Um, but that was a really – that was a tough time and then – um, I remember talking with Derek and it's just the relationship we have. We're very open with each other. I said, you just need to move down here because you can't be a partner until you're down here. And it was right. I had no network down here. Yes. I was, I was, you know, I was really just appearing for a certain number of hours a day and disappearing again. Yeah. I was doing a lot of work. I was probably, you know, dictating in the, in, on the M1 every morning and every <laughs> afternoon and logging back on. But, um, when hubby came back from Canberra anyway, I was like, right, life needs to get a whole lot simpler mm-hmm. right now. Yep. So we moved down um, and the kids were two and uh, – no, four and almost two by that stage. And um, and then I was able to actually embrace the Gold Coast and the Gold Coast lifestyle and create a network 
and which I absolutely love. I have the most amazing network and I know our networks mm-hmm. overlap a lot and we've got some amazing women in that network. Um, and, yeah, and that's when I finally started to find balance. Love that story. Mm. Love that story. Thanks, Stace. So, Stacey, we have a segment on the podcast called Leadership <laughs> and it is the shittiest thing that maybe we've seen in leadership. Sometimes it's a self-confessional sort of mm. process where we go – oh, that's something I did that I wouldn't do again. Yeah. Uh, something we've learnt from. Um, anything for you that springs to mind about um, something you did that you're like, mm, that didn't work yeah. as a leader? <laughs> um, oh, gosh, I probably do things all the time. Um, I, I'm definitely having, you know, what the you-know-what moments in my head constantly. Why did I do that? Um, so leadership... Um, I think the the things that have really um, <laughs> left me feeling a little bit broken and um, struggling with this whole I'm a leader um, hat sometimes are the, are the things that probably impact me more so than the team, which is at least a good leader shit, I suppose. Um, I'm probably being more shitty to myself than to them, but um, that's when I um, sort of take a step back and go, I'm just... I'm just not doing this right. I'm doing something wrong. Mm. I need to actually talk to some coaches or professionals who need who tell me what to do. Um, and those moments are, you know, usually when I focus too much on other people um, and invest a little bit too much in in them more so than um, having a better perspective on what's happening for the whole team or for the whole firm. Okay. Um, you know, when you um, perhaps become a little bit invested too much in one relationship or um, a team member's problems and you forget that you need to have that perspective around, um, you know, what's right for the whole team environment and, and also what's right for you because you have to protect yourself a little bit as a leader as yes. well. Yeah, um, there has to be that some of that space yeah and I'm learning that it's Mm. it's taking me a long time but those when I I heard about your leadership concept I was like well those leadership things for me are the things that keep me awake at night Mm -hmm. um because those are the things that remind me that I can't do this long term if I keep sweating this stuff because it it does actually eat me up and if you know if if I'm laying in bed at two o'clock in the morning thinking about oh I wish I had done this um, and, oh, I, I wonder if that person still likes me um, or am I being a complete imposter standing in this role, mm-hmm. um, then I, you know, that's the stuff that's going to drive me out of what I'm doing sooner than I than I want to. Mm. Um, and I do do that. I do have, um, you know, certainly times, especially over, I, I mentioned before that I had to make a resolution for myself at the start of this year to sort of put myself forward first and push some things down. Um and, and that's because, you know, there's been times recently where I've, I've lost perspective of what my role is um, in the firm and for the team. Um, I'm constantly saying to my lawyers, you've got to make decisions that are best for you. Best for you yes. personally. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about the firm. You know, we're, we're together for sometimes only a short time. But, you know, go do something that you need to do. It might put you on a different path. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but do that. But then when they go and do it, <laughs> I'm like, what? Wait, no, no, you're doing the wrong thing. That's Don't right. do that. Yes. Stay here. Of course I'm the best thing for you. <laughs> um, and that's fine. That happens more frequently than I would like. Turnover is a real thing mm-hmm. in the legal industry, um, especially with these bloody recruiters, yeah. like constantly calling them. You know who I'm talking about. Um, and, it's, and it's <laughs> tough, right? It's tough when, um, as you said, for you, and I know this – from your leadership kind of style is that, you know, that that mentoring piece and the coaching piece and the personal and professional development that you want to give to your lawyers and, and to your staff. And I, I hear from leaders that when you when you put that, it feels like you put like your heart and that into all yeah. of this for this person and then they turn around and go, thank you so much, but now I'm off, bye-bye. Yes. You're like, wait a minute, yeah. <laughs> I thought that we there was something, what? I know. And, um, and it's that age-old thing, you know, like do we invest, you know, what about if I invest in our people and they leave? Yeah. But what about if we don't invest in them and they stay? Yes. I mean, which is worse there. Yeah. I mean, 
Um, and I think this this fluidity of, of our workforce uh, and just people's working lives, I think we're going to see more of that where people sort of come and go and work on a project and then maybe there's a spin-off of another business from the law firm and they end up working for you in that space and then mm. come back and then they might do something and you might go and work on a project with them at some point. Like yeah, it's I, think, I think you're right. I think it's there a needs great to be a change, here. A change mm. in the way that we um, perceive what the, um, the path of your typical law graduate through to whatever that ultimately their goals are um, and those working relationships can be different um, to what we're, we're used to. But you're quite right. I don't want to clip anyone's wings, so to speak, no. so they can't fly the cage, but... Um, it's hard. It's though. still really hard. Yeah. Um, Derek actually, in his very brutal and blunt way, said to me once um, recently when I was struggling with this a little bit, he said, you know, you may have thought this about that relationship, but just remember at the end of the day, you're the one that controls the paycheck each week. Mm -hmm. So the perception they have on the relationship is, is a little bit different. Yes. And maybe that skews it a little bit towards something which, you know, you don't like or is away from you know, perhaps not the genuine um, relationship that you thought it was. It's just a different one. And mm. I, I don't, it didn't sit well with me at first, but um, then I was like, okay, I need to have a different perspective on this. And um, it, as, you, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm the type of person that that just doesn't sit well with me because I don't want to be that cynical. I, I want to – I'm an mm. all-in kind of person. Yes. If you're in my, you know, if you're in with me, you're in with me and you get all of it. Um, so then when you leave, it's like, wait, what? Why? Mm. And, you know, you, but, yeah, it's, it's to tough. keep that bit of space. And, and so I talk to a lot of law firm owners about this. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to make it a gender issue, but um, there's a lot of women yes. that speak to me well, that makes about sense. this um, around – Particularly, you know, when they're growing their firm um, from, you know, a size of, you know, a few lawyers where the culturally and the feel is very different and then as it gets larger and larger, um, what that means for them and just the relationship that they have with the people that work for them. Yes. As you said, you, yes. you're paying them. Yeah. It's, it's a paid professional yeah. relationship. Yeah. <laughs> when I'm well, just, you know, I just, it's tough. I know. I need to maybe work on that Stockholm syndrome stuff, and just <laughs> it's not working out for me. They're not yes. falling for it. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's, it's and, and the likability piece, of course, yeah. um, around you know wanting to be liked, um, and and sometimes that being at the forefront of mm. of our minds. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot in that that we could um, we could chat more about. Yeah, about a bottle of red. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I've, look, I I mentioned before I've got a great network and I've got some amazing friends who are also in this space. And I swear, one of them in particular, you'd know who it was, just wants to slap me across the face when I start talking. <laughs> just like, snap out of it! Don't be silly. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. So around then. Um, around like we've spoken a lot around what young lawyers or, or professionals are wanting from their leaders. If we flip that, what do you look for? So when you're looking for someone to join the firm, um, what sort of characteristics or attributes or – and obviously there's some skill-based stuff there. Yeah. Obviously you need to tick the boxes there as well. But what are you looking for? Uh, for me, it's all about dynamic. When you've got a um, boutique practice, it's it's important to um, be conscious of what personalities and type of lawyers you have in the office already and whether or not somebody coming in is going to fit that dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I look for someone whose CV may reflect some hard work um, and long-term commitment. I love somebody who wants to be there long-term. Um, but it, it, you know, it really uh, does come down to the interview always when I'm recruiting. And um, if I've got a good feel about that person, they have a sensible conversation with me um, and they genuinely have an interest and passion for the law um, and, um, and in particular commercial litigation and insolvencies, obviously the bonus 
um, and want to stay on the Gold Coast and be part of a team, give back to the community. We're yes. very community-minded at Cronin Miller. Um, and those sorts of things are the things that I look for. Um, I never ask for an academic transcript um, and I actually really infrequently look at them. If They usually say, do you want me to send it through? And I say no. Um, we actually just recently went through a PLT recruitment process and I had one student um, send through a CV with his, with his academic transcript. Mm. Um, and we didn't have many um, takers, unfortunately, so I only interviewed about five people. And I said to him in the interview, at the end of the interview, um, and I knew it wasn't the right fit, um, having nothing to do with his academic transcript, but I said to him at the end, I said, can I give you some feedback? Um, because his, his transcript had something called Amber Alerts in it. Um, and I had to look it up. I was like, what's an Amber Alert? Like, oh, <laughs> warning, okay. yeah. warning. It was literally, they're literally yes. warnings. Okay. And um, so when I went into the interview with him, I wanted to give him some interviews experience these these guys are only in uni so they've, okay. they've got no experience um when they're coming forward for a plt position um it was really good he was a nice guy obviously on track to be an academic i, I don't know if he'll see the inside of a law firm i don't know if he really wants to but mm-hmm. um i said to him I, I said can i give you some feedback of, about your cv um and your academic transcript just don't send the academic transcript through. I'm very much a interview type employer. I want mm-hmm. to meet you. I want to have a conversation with you, um, see what the vibe is, um, make sure that, you know, we get on. Um, and then if I need to see your academics for some reason, I'll ask for it. Um, but he wouldn't, if, you know, if he had sent that off to another firm, he wouldn't have got to the interview yes. stage. Um, and there are a multitude of reasons why you might not perform well at university. There might be health issues, there might be personal trauma or tragedy um, that interrupts, uh, you know, your typical three or four year degree. So don't lead with that if that's going to cause issues for you. Yeah, that's uh, not the selling point to no, have out the no, front of not. the window. And it's not the be all and end all oh. as well. So Oh, goodness. Like if I was to look at the lawyers that I know um, and those that have from a traditional point of view, have been highly successful, mm. the most successful from a financial point of view. Um, I mean, academically, uh, you wouldn't have hired them, <laughs> but great at business, but yes. great business minds yeah. and great with people yeah. and, and that connection piece, right? Absolutely. So they have just gone leap and bounds. Um, so, yeah, start strong, lead yes, strong, with that. I start think with that. is a good message there. Uh, and I talk about uh, putting yourself out there, Stacey. I don't let a guest leave this podcast studio without giving me some love dating advice. Stacey, I've been single for a long time. <laughs> you know, it's coming on about seven years now. Okay. I'm ready. I really feel – I'm. What, what are we in now? We're, we're nearly halfway through the year. This I've dubbed this the year of big love. Now, I've put it out there in the universe every week in the podcast. So I'm hoping that th- thought energy manifestation that this happens. Yeah. We're halfway through. It's, yes. Anyway, we've still got half a year to go. <laughs> so tell me, Stacey, what, what am I doing wrong out there? What's, what's going on? I'm give like me the some worst advice. I'm person to give you any advice. I <laughs> met my husband at university and. Were you studying together or no? no. He's um, he's electronics engineering, and I was um, arts and later arts law. Um, mm-hmm. I and I don't know any single men. I don't know a single single man. The people keep telling me this, and I don't. I because obviously I ask at the network. I mean, everyone knows. Yeah. Uh, no secret. Everyone's like, I like anyone. Yeah. Friend of a friend. Does your husband, does anyone know anyone? People are like, no. Nope. I know. I'm it's like, how come I know so many single women? Yes. Well. But no single men, Stacey. Well, it's funny you should say that. The last um, friend I had that separated for, from her husband, I remember thinking, I don't know, I don't have any single men to introduce her to, um, is now in a relationship with a woman. So maybe that's just. Oh, what, what, does, what are they do? called? Uh, lesbian. Uh, like Lils? <laughs> is it Lils? Oh, I don't know. It's called Later in Life Lesbian. Oh, so there's a name, Lils. Yeah. That's what that's Oh, my what gosh, it is. she couldn't be happier. I'm so happy for her. So maybe you just need to be even more open. 
than what you currently More open than what may be. Watch this space, people. (laughs) Watch this space. Uh, Stacey, we have a little message from the universe to give you at the end of the podcast. We have these boxes like fortune cookies without the cookie. So we have trust your crazy ideas or we have carpe diem to choose from today. Okay. Well, I'm not really one for crazy ideas, so I'll carpe, carpe diem. diem. All righty. Let me open the box. Uh, pick one of those, Stacey, and pop it open at the front and let's see. Oh, I see. have things like this for my kids. Yeah. Yeah. I cool love you on it, right? and oh, I put them in okay. their lunch boxes every now and then. Look, you are a super mum. Well, it's usually after <laughs> I've screamed at them or thrown the hairbrush away in fury, and then here, have it's a like card. Quickly, mummy slip, loves you. Slip that in their lunch box so they remember I actually do love them. Um, okay, yeah. so it says, visualize this thing you want, see it, feel it, believe in it, make your mental blueprint, and begin. I love that. There you go. Just as I was saying, thought energy manifestation yes. right there in Perfect. our card. Perfect. I'm going to keep this and put it at my desk. Well, it has been an absolute delight, Stacey, Thank to you. have you in the studio. Um, where can people find you? When I Googled, there wasn't a whole lot of um, – I couldn't get any deep, dark secrets on Stacey by I'm Google. That's a good thing as a lawyer, though, yes. I think. Yes. It I is a good thing. You've done a great job there. It's funny because, as I keep saying, I am an open book. Like, I really am, but I'm just – I'm one of those extroverted introverts. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not really putting myself out there. Um, again, just polar opposite to my um, dear business partner. <laughs> um, but you can find me at Cronin Miller Litigation, so that's croninmiller.com.au and on LinkedIn. Um, please do um, track me down on LinkedIn because I love expanding my network um, and seeing what I can do for you um, and, you know, what – what those valuable connections bring can be um, wonderful. Absolutely. So connect with me. Thank you, Stacey. Well, that is a wrap on the podcast uh, this week. It has been an uh, absolute delight. And so go out there this week uh, and spread your magic in life, in love and in leadership. I'm Midja and thank God it's Monday. We trust you enjoyed this episode of the Mondays with Midja podcast. Host Midja Fisher is a leadership expert, keynote speaker, coach and facilitator. To find out more about Midja, visit midja.com.au or follow her on Instagram, Midja Fisher. And make sure you subscribe, share and leave a review. 